You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Hey, everybody. This is Abhinav Narayan, our moderator for the episode. Hey, Cecil. How's it going? Real good. Great. So for this episode, we're doing something a little bit different. We wanted to kind of do a project study on something that Falcons recently completed. Uh, what could, could you go ahead and introduce the project for us? Yeah, sure. It's Atlantis in Hainan Island in Sanya. It's the very first um, international execution of the Atlantis brand in China, mainland China. What was Falcons responsible for on this project? We were involved in developing the story and the kind of overarching theme of both the water park, Aqua Adventures, as well as the Lost Chambers, which is the aquarium component to the resort. And we've got two panels that we're going to be talking to today. And our first panel, who do we have? Our first panel will consist of Rob Wilson, as well as Stephen Ricker and Joe Schaefer. And then uh, we're going to move on to our second panel. Our second panel will be Chuck Yex and Patrick Riley. Great. Well, we'll go ahead and jump into that conversation, and we'll uh, circle back with you, Cecil, for some closing thoughts. That sounds great. Thank you, Abhinav. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourselves, starting with Rob. Uh, Hi, I'm Rob Wilson, and I'm project manager here at Falcon's Treehouse. And during the Sanya project, I was a production designer. I'm Steven Ricker. I'm an associate creative director. And during the Atlantis project, I was a set designer. And lastly, I'm Joe Schaefer. I'm the technical design manager here at Falcons. And uh, while we were working on this, I was a technical designer. So to start, how do you craft a story that drives the design of an aquarium or water park? Rob, you want to start us off? Sure. I think with this project especially, we had a client who has an existing brand that's known uh, for their previous installations in the Bahamas and in Dubai. Right. So we wanted to take an approach that stemmed very differently, that went in a totally different direction than their dig, archaeology-based idea and concept behind their previous uh, Dubai and Bahamas Atlantis. So for this project, we looked at a story that could drive all of the elements of architecture and all of the choices in the tank exhibits and water park features that's very different than a modern archaeological dig or ruins. Mm -hmm. And it led to this mermaid princess character that we created who falls in love with a Chinese prince, which is why he built this incredible Atlantean wonderland on the surface to remind her of home. Which explains why uh, it is a bit of a departure from the the existing uh, Atlantis resort, uh, from it being kind of an ancient ruins to this beautiful, grand, um, you know, brand new uh, elegant space. Throughout the space, there's all sorts of references to aquatic life and the fact that it is an aquarium and you're in their realm, not the other way around. Almost as if the fish were looking in, Mm. all right, rather than the other way around. The the people were the exhibit. Right, kind (laughs) of. And that's kind of like made evident like in a lot of the like the elevations and the details, there's lots of like elements taken from like whale fins and clams and oysters. There's lots of like scenic elements that reflect those creatures. There's anatomical features that we took as inspiration. Uh, Pat started one of those ideas, right? That the shape of the fluke of the beluga whale, which we knew from the client they wanted as one of their main exhibit animals, And we had a couple of those big parameters from the client early that they wanted to have the ambassador tank be this massive, almost football field-sized tank filled with whale sharks. It's one of the most challenging species for any international aquarium exhibit to house. There's very few that do that. So we put those as the main focus uh, from both sides, from the aquarium side and from the Hotel, the hotel side, um, the hotel side. Yeah, that's what uh, the suite side. side that you can have suites directly connected to the massive ambassador tank. And in contrast to the conceptual storyline and the approach that we took to you know create this space, we also we learned such a great deal about the life safety of the marine animals 
You know, we're used to creating spaces for people and, you know, we understand the design of safety and accessibility in, in those spaces. So we got to learn all about different marine species and what they need to not only survive but thrive. Uh, yeah. You had to have lattices for the lobsters to be able to crawl over in the crustacean tank. Made, that makes their lives easier and less stressful, apparently, if they can cling to and climb across a lattice work structure. The whole walls of that crustacean tank have these build-outs that let them climb and situate themselves, and they can climb actually overhead on yourself. It's a tunnel. In a tunnel form of an But the sharper and more jagged edges, the better for them. The layout of the Atlantean chambers was so complex and so detailed um, that we couldn't stick to a classic style of drawing. I mean, we did, but everything was everything's super hyper organic, um, curved, everything. rounded edges on every single thing. No wall goes flat, and they all wrap around each other. So we had to figure out ways to unwrap those elements and flatten out the data so that people could actually begin to construct the wall finishes and put the columns wrapped around at the custom fabrication. The challenge of that Atlantean regal style yes, that you guys exactly. were creating. Yeah. Uh, another term we, we used a lot was uh, Atlantean Nouveau. So it had this Art <laughs> Nouveau curvilinear uh, feel to it, um, but really drew inspiration from undersea forms as well. Are there any challenges beyond the fish life and the, and the yeah. pipeline? Yeah, uh, coming from a theatrical background, Lighting is such a, a critical element uh, to help create this immersive space. And with the, the overall layout and the design of the guest experience not having a straight line in it, it became very critical to find opportunities to add texture and color through lighting that, from a practical side, it didn't create all of these terrible reflections on these great big glass you know, walls surrounding them. Let's switch over and talk about the water park for a little bit, because that Atlantean regal style, that narrative of the, the uh, Chinese prince building this monument for, you know, out of love, you have one consistent narrative motivating all of this, but you could argue that there are two very different energies in an aquarium space versus a water park space. <laughs> How do you balance maintaining the same architectural language, the same design across two very different atmospheres? Yeah, the big the big difference between them is the mood you try to set in both places, right? So the aquarium is somewhere that's awe-inspiring or somewhere you're going uh, to this aquarium. It's a place that you're not normally allowed to go to. You're being invited to go to this um, mystical almost place where uh, you're almost in the same environment with all these animals. It's, it's somewhere spiritual. Right, yeah. It's somewhere where um, you have full light control and we can make it be as dramatic or exciting as, as we want it to as you want. Exactly, as designers. We get to decide that. Um, but when you deal with water parks, uh, they're normally outside, so you lose the element of light control. So um, the other fact is that people go to water parks for fun. It's, um, they go there to be excited. They go there for thrill rides. They go there for the slides. Um, whereas the people are going to, uh, the chambers to see something they've never seen before. Um, they'll spend more time in the chambers. Um, whereas with rides or slides, it's a quick, you know, it's a quick burn excitement. Um, the most time you get to capture them in those ride towers is on their climb up. So that's you try true. to make a lot of the really exciting features not concentrated on dropping past some big overhanging scenic element or something like that. Because they'll miss it. Because they'll definitely miss it. It never works. And it's a waste of resources from a planning perspective. Mm. When you have them climbing for half an hour, sometimes an hour, up these six or eight flights of stairs, you want to make that experience not super boring. And it also comes down to the type of experience. Uh, it's really an awe-inspiring experience versus a thrilling experience. You know, you're, both are enjoyable and have their own emotional arc. However, they lead almost to a different place. There's, of course, a different energy as well. There's a little, it's a little bit more contemplative in an aquarium. It's a little mm -hmm. bit more you absorbing something 
and a water park is, of course, there's a lot of momentum. Is, is that echoed in you the architecture? See, you can see that reflected really readily in the basic forms where there's not a single sharp point or edge, corner, or flat in the entire chamber's experience. There are a multitude of sharp edges, points, precipices, and different shapes that we're making in the water park that almost has a flora and fauna distinction where the aquarium, the chambers, is inspired in form by the underwater fauna. Right. And some of the elements in the water park are inspired by some of the ground flora, leaves, trees. There's really a duality uh, to the two experiences, you know, an inward and an outer, outward uh, kind of masculine and feminine energies kind of also reflecting uh, within being within the water and being outdoors uh, um, out of the water in the water park. You are not only designing for um, people and or fish, you are also designing for the water itself, like as an element. Mm -hmm. There's water filtration, I would imagine. There's mm -hmm. water treatment. How does that influence what yeah, you guys are doing? There's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that guests don't ever see. And I, I mean, everyone will always say that. That's the case with every park. There's always back of house. There's always trade secrets. Um, but the thing that jumps to mind immediately are behind the beluga tank, there are two huge holding tanks to hold those whales. Mm -hmm. um, and we had to work the passageways for those tanks into the design of the beluga tank because they have to be able to, when they want to get in and clean the beluga tank, they have to be able to get the whales out or if they need to for medical reasons or whatever, they have to be able to get those whales out of the tank and into a holding tank that's behind the without, scenes. Without stressing the animal. Right. You don't lift them out. You put you give them an easy path that they can follow. Right. And similarly, each tank has its own water filtration system, by and large. Um, that way, if there's an issue with mm -hmm. one tank, it doesn't affect the marine life in the others. Yeah, every tank has its own catwalk and staircase that has to be dedicated for it. There was a few challenges we met early on, and one of the first things we had to coordinate with an outside vendor team, the client, was on the thickness of the glass for each of the tank sizes we chose. When we looked at a porthole style circular aperture mm -hmm. or even a hemispherical <clears throat> aperture that we did to, to accentuate what Joe mentioned earlier of the fish looking into us as the exhibit, that we're always underwater, we had to change the sizes of what we thought different species needed for their tanks based on what was achievable for glass thickness and water retention and safety. And also understanding the physics of how light passes through glass and through water and understanding the sight lines of each tank. And curved mm. and angled glass. Exactly. What you can see, what you can't see. Yeah, that's that what I was wondering was, about. That last one was really important. Yeah. Yeah. There was so much sight lines into the sight tank. line studies that we had to do. We because... had to do mock-ups constantly to figure out what we were looking at digitally and, and physically to see what you could actually invest your money in inside of the tank. Mm -hmm. Some walls don't need any treatment if they're not getting any angle of view. Right, exactly. And one of the major scenic, uh, it's, not, it's not a chandelier. It's like a, yeah, it's it like is. Appendix it's like chandelier. A, no, it's a chandelier. I mean, it's like a big chandelier. Yeah, it's, How do you classify a chandelier? I don't know. So I it's, kind of, it's kind of a, chandelier. it's a chandelier with like octopus arms that connect it to the ceiling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's this cool thing that extends out and the lines with the light through it pulse and then cause this kind of pulsing heart of the organic energy source that powers the whole chambers. So that goes through things on the wall, but things that are that are like gobo lights or other theatrical lighting that are projected onto the walls of the tanks became a big consideration that Stephen had to do a lot of study with to figure out where our tank fronts could be faced and where we had to turn and curve the walls even more to make sure that the things didn't reflect across each other. As well as where the light sources could be in relation. What about plant life? There was not very much. This, the I whole mean, thing. Was, what do you classify coral as? It's kind of like a half plant, half sure. fish. There was a there was a <laughs> tank number twenty one in the upstairs, uh, one of the larger upstairs kidney bean shaped sort of tanks. They all got names like that. Yeah, they got names based on shapes. There's yeah. like a liver tank. <laughs> For some reason, we just like went with doctor, like easy. anatomical terms. <laughs> this one was kidney remember? tank, liver tank. <laughs> so okay. this one, this one was a challenging one because the coral. So okay. this large backdrop wall that the client wanted to put a coral species that needs a time growth. You oh, have yeah. to plant different bits of coral and concrete for the coral to grow on. 
So you, we had to design the tank in this weird sequence where we would get pieces that had to go into it that would then be built early and start growing coral yeah. on this back wall. If you remember, we had to design that based on how we wanted it to look at the end and then basically reverse engineer to account for the fact that the coral is probably not going to look like that when it starts. Exactly. So you had to build the platforms and the landings. And it still looked years. good enough right. for the first year or two or three right. and then would still be built out right over time as the coral grew. Right, right, right. And that was, that one was, the coral tank was particularly challenging from a lighting standpoint because it had artificial sunlight 24 hours a day mm-hmm. and just completely blasted the as entire part room. of the life support system. Yeah. yeah. So another thing I wanted to mention is how to make an aquarium um, more immersive, more interactive, because at the end of the day, you can go to... Um, basically any aquarium and see fish behind plexi. Um, that's a fairly normal thing. But um, I guess the the big challenge was how to take that to the next level and how to get that interaction so that the guests feel like they're part of the exhibit, that they're a part of this journey. How did you accomplish that? One of the best ways, I think, that you can get uh, people interacting with marine life is actually let them interact with marine life, right? So one of the ways we did it, as you come into the, the chambers, there's uh, the big grand reveal of the beluga tank. And then as you round the corner right behind it um, is this interactive tank. Um, it, frames you, you, it frames you central to the open atrium area right. when you get to the touch tank. And it's kind of a knee wall high uh, tank that you can reach down into. Right. One of the cool things we wanted to do from the start was make the whole thing clear acrylic, like a sitting bowl, if you can imagine one of the old style bathtubs, if it was all made of glass, just sitting on the surface. Yeah, like a high-end sink fixture. Exactly. So we wanted to make this really compound curvature, uh, again, almost kidney bean shaped uh, curved glass. But when we got to the uh, glass manufacturer providing all of the, the acrylic, they couldn't do compound curvature in more than two directions. So we had to figure out a compromise on the structural design of that tank for the viewing of the guests to still see a completely clear edge-lit acrylic bowl while also being able to physically build it and get the piping through for all of the oxygen and life support Mm -hmm. and water filtration in a concrete base. For all of you, what was your favorite moment on this project or what was your greatest takeaway? Uh, What I really enjoyed about the Atlantis project was really the complete immersive design that, you know, from the floor to the ceiling to the walls to inside the tanks, outside the tanks, uh, lighting effects. We got to create this incredibly immersive and magical place. And as we kept progressing the drawings and refining and refining, it became sharper and clearer in all of our minds and we knew that this was gonna be something really special. Uh, It was unique because it pushed everyone outside, at least everyone I was working with at the time, outside of our comfort zone for the time. Um, It was a type of project, it wasn't a theme park, um, but it was, like we've said time and time again in this conversation, it was having to worry about something that you don't usually have to worry about, and that's other living things that aren't guests. I think a lot of times, especially with what I do. I'm an engineer, so I love the technical nature of things and having to deal with access and necessity for filtration systems and all this stuff that makes sure that the exhibits stay as good as they can be for as long as they can be. Um, I I found that fascinating. My other favorite thing with any project, and I think we're all in the same boat, everybody in this room, um, is when you start to see things come together, right? Yeah, Rob's motioning as a camera for for photos. The the flashing, seeing the pictures come from your head to a piece of paper, even from your head to a a written word of story. And then it goes to another member of your team who interprets that into a piece of art. And it goes to another member of your team. And then that goes to another member of your team who interprets that into a plan. And that goes to another member of your team who expands that into colors and materials. And then somebody takes that from your team to the site, to the facility, and they send you back pictures or video in front of a thing you imagined. That's one of the most special things we get to do. Yeah. I think that about wraps it up. Thanks, guys. We'll move on to our next panel. So uh, let's start with Chuck. Okay. 
My name is Chuck Yex, I'm art director for Falcon's Treehouse, and um, on the project I was a field art director, spent nine months on the project directing the vendors in coordination with the owners. Patrick Riley, senior concept artist, uh, was basically in charge of uh, the design and the look of the, uh, the attraction. To start, how do you begin to conceptualize an aquarium experience like this? What, what unique factors did you encounter when designing this space? Well, I had to reference a lot of uh, undersea structures, whether it's uh, pretty much basically natural, and then sometimes we'd incorporate it with man-made either uh, vehicles or structures that, that are specifically made to be underwater. Did some of that reference come from previous Atlantis projects, or was there a, a new look? Uh, I think there were some uh, undersea projects that Falcons had done before, and we had used some of the images that we had done for that as reference, but a lot of the stuff we just tried to grab from everything we could find on the internet, whether it was a video game or movie or, you know, we tried to get ideas from everywhere so that we can get as many ideas as possible. How was this project used as a reinvention of the already existing Atlantis brand? They wanted to be in line with what they had already done for Atlantis, but they wanted to be a different experience. Okay. They wanted to be from the same world, but just a, a different culture. Yeah, so it, it's uh, the brand continues with uh, the Atlantis at Sanya, mm -hmm. uh, but the details and the, the finishes and, and uh, some of the sculptures and structures are, are different within the peripherals that they set for the aquarium sizes and shapes and what animals and exactly. species would be inside them. So kind of trying to be a, an expansion of the lore, an expansion of the visual language of the brand. Correct. Yeah. 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 Was... I believe we went with, um, instead of uh, like they unearthed a uh, aged and falling apart Atlantis, we unearthed a pristine Atlantis. New exactly. Surviving. And actually existing, like we just discovered a lost world that it still exists, pretty much. Yeah. What was it like to start defining that fictional architecture? Like how, do you, how do you even start a process like that? Uh, yeah, I think we pretty much just started even with uh, just some nebulous designs. It didn't even have to be buildings, it just could be structures or statues that might be found in their society. It was one of the first key arts I did. It was just, I just made, basically did some organic shapes and started adding shading to it and color to it until a structure formed. And then from there, I just started picking at I, you know, ideas that I had in my mind as far as uh, things that would apply to undersea designs. And then from there, we just kind of started like shaving down things that we did need or, you know, did need and started molding it into the idea that we were looking for. When it comes to a space like this, how, how, how is the process of designing an aquarium different from designing another type of themed experience? Well, I don't know that it's too different. It's just another palette. Just, you know, the, the boundaries and the, you know, we're designing walls and ceilings. Yeah. You okay. know, an indoor thing instead of, you know, an outdoor project. There were, some, there were some restrictions on it for the, uh, the, the wildlife that was going to be in the tanks, obviously. Course, um, yeah. We had to take that into consideration. You know, we couldn't just do whatever. There were certain things that uh, they felt were might be a little too sharp that the animals might harm themselves on that we had yeah, to Yeah, one of those off. was the, the whale that? sharks. Yeah. Uh, the, nothing in the whale shark tank, which was the really large tank, yeah. could be more than three meters high. Exactly. Okay. Because the fish would hurt themselves. Okay. Yeah, and certain things had to be so, so, uh, designs had to be changed, but it was nothing too major. Is there anything more that comes with the territory of trying to make a visual style feel seamless, but still having to blend it into a living ecosystem space? And any other examples that you can give? There was a motif in the designs that was recurring, which was um, almost like these gills that had intakes that could almost be used to, uh, to flow oxygen through different chambers. So I kind of incorporated that into the design. There was a lot of these repetitive looking like gill uh, uh, type uh, motifs throughout the, uh, the design. That's, and, a, uh, so. that's a terrific. That's just one example, like. but there were other little things in there with the color palette and textures and stuff like that. So. Yeah, the, the color palette is, um, when doing a aquarium, you got to be able to have the foresight to know that people are going to be viewing this from th through the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the water changes color. That's a great point. And it's you got to you have to um, expand or emphasize your 
contrasts. Otherwise, everything gets lost and it looks like the same color. Um, I got a lot of strange looks from the vendors when we pumped up the volume on the contrast. And, the, and, and it almost looks funny, bef but before you put the water in, but yeah. once the water came in, they realized, oh, wow, as I see it now. Speaking towards the relationship of from the beginning of the project to the execution at the end of the project, was there any communication that you guys kept ongoing towards the end of the project? You know, Patrick, you did the yeah. initial s sketches and art yeah. to define that style. Yeah. Or, or was it pretty much just set and definitive that you had everything you needed to work with? Yeah, I had uh, plenty of drawings and direction, and, and I spent a couple weeks uh, with uh, the creative group um, before I went off to China just to talk about certain things and look and feel and make sure that, you know, I was on the same page as they were. Because they've been working on this thing for a year or more. Yeah. And I just jumped into the game for yeah. two weeks before yeah. I went out there. So um, I, I, there was plenty of phone calls back and forth at, at the beginning of the project. Yeah. You know, when there's something came up. I don't think there was yeah. any communication between you and I. No, I didn't. Uh, it was uh, uh, Stephen and uh, Joe more than anybody. Well, yeah, just yeah. our creative manager because he was, that was his part of the yeah. project. What does on-site art direction involve? What are the steps like to take a concept design on paper and realize it in the real world and in another country? Yeah, right, yeah. I think that to understand the project, um, the look and feel at its end, what it's, uh, you know, the final look and feel of everything, and to relay that to the vendors and to the owners so they know what to expect at the end of this project. And then just to uh, be there uh, on a daily basis to help guide and answer questions and you know check colors and finishes. But being like what we call a creative guardian, we, we have to understand with the end in mind. And as a field art director, that it's a daily process and it's, uh, it's cool to see everything come together, you know, evolve. Yeah, I'm sure everyone wanted to see all the screenshots that you were taking of the actual yeah, look what you drew. Yeah, Patrick, yeah, right. this came out really great. <laughs> what was what, what like? What's a common issue that may have cropped up on a day to day basis? Well, it, with an aquarium, um, the understanding the species and the animal in that kind of process, both on the concept side and on the on site art direction side, who's communicating that insight to you? Who's communicating that natural uh, world expertise? The owners of the project had marine biologists on site that I worked with often. And if there was ever a question, they would come and look at the sculpture in, in, in process. And they would help me understand these things. And we would work together to make it safe for the animal, yet still appealing and attractive. What was their input like on the concept side? Well, like mentioned earlier, I mean, every once in a while we would do a sketch because usually that's how it starts out. We do a sketch, we send it, we, we get approval for it, and sometimes there'd be notes on it. Yeah. Okay, we need to tell them something down. You know, like I said, it was mostly architectural stuff like... Uh, the three meters high. The three meters high, and uh, this, this area right here, this, uh, this crevice is too small. You know, animal might get stuck in here, so make it a little bit wider. Or oh, interesting. Don't, don't make these uh, design motifs so sharp because they might, you know, scrape up against the skin of it, so make it rounded off. So I would have to come up with a way to round off any sharp edges, but still make it look like part of the design and the rest of the, uh, the attraction. Was there a particular animal that was the uh, neediest in terms of what kind of habitat they required? Uh, yeah, it was the beluga whale. So I did some reading and research on it and, and then working with their marine biologist on site that that animal in itself is the skin is pretty fragile, Yeah, that it can, it can get hurt. What was your favorite moment on this project, or what was your greatest takeaway? You are free to answer both if you have an answer to both. Probably my favorite was basically finally uh, after the initial concept sketches and whittling everything down to the look we're going for was finally doing the final key arts and adding the colors and seeing it, doing a, even doing the uh, elevations for it and watching all of that become realized and you actually finally get to see everything and you have a better understanding of what this would look like when it finally surrounds you and it becomes an actual location. So you've, you've defined a new visual style and now exactly. it's all come together. Becoming a reality, yeah. I would say pretty much the same thing. You know, when I got there, there was, you know, brick and white walls. 
<laughs> and in the nine months I seen, you know, we built a water park and we built an aquarium and, you know, there was finished pieces and they were starting to put water in some of these and the colors and the jewels and everything just come into life. So being able to look at what Patrick and some of the others drew and then say, hey, guys, look at this. Yeah. this is, here it is finished in real life. And then seeing photos come back from you guys to st- and then seeing it match up with the, uh, yeah. the concept art was yeah. uh, pretty incredible also. Yeah. What was your role in the development of the water park? We did the detail design for the towers, uh, the giant, two giant slide towers, some of the other buildings, the entryways, some of the area development, the shade structures. Uh, we did all the rock work for the uh, Lazy River. Um, so, yeah, we were more than half my time was probably spent on the water park. It's the same narrative, and it's the same architectural visual style. Is there a different approach that you have to take when designing a water park versus an aquarium? It's two different environments. One is theoretically set underwater, so uh, you have more of that underwater uh, feel, just like kind of catering to the style and look of fishes underwater. For the water park, it's more like... You get to uh, really go underwater. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's more like a culture of uh, a cross between humans and the sea. So it's 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 a melding of the two rather than just being 99% ocean uh, uh, inspired. It's right. more human architecture and the ocean kind of a mix of the two for the oh, yeah. water parks. Yeah. I don't know that I got too involved in the... The psychology of it all. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> early on. And, it's like a lot of people throwing ideas around, right. and then they're like, the okay, water, let's go in this direction. Yeah, in the this, water and park, I was, yeah, we were just yeah. more concerned with, you know, size, shape and color and texture yeah. and, you know. Chuck, is it safe to assume that there are significant changes to the original design that must be made when you're on site? Yes, uh, site conditions and uh, that process always bring changes in every project I've ever worked on. Hopefully they're not too significant, that we can do something quickly and modify something to fit. Sometimes some sizes or shapes or corners of a building don't match up like what we thought they would. Um, there was an incident, um, or an instance, I, I'd say, the um, looking in from the guest perspective into the giant tank, We had these four giant columns that they were probably 15 meters high, maybe bigger, um, with these windows that were next to them. And the vendor didn't field measure correctly. Or they were going off of drawings without field measuring, and somebody ahead of them changed something. So the spacing was different, and and they brought these giant columns that they worked on for a month or two or whatever. And... uh, it didn't fit. So they, without really thinking about it, wanted to just cut the top off. And we're like, no, you can't do that. That's no. a decorative top. Yeah. We have to cut sections of eat of, out of the middle yeah. and then join it all back together. Otherwise, it would have looked funny. What's it like to work with vendors internationally? Um, you keep an open mind. It's, it's really cool. It's, it's uh, a learning experience. Um, they are conscientious, uh, the Chinese people. Uh, they really want to do a good job. Their mindset and their order is a little different than ours. But what they want to happen is the same. They want the best product they can make. Right. Um, you know, all the years of experience and watching people build things, um, I came to China that we were doing the sculptures for the uh, inside the aquarium, and uh, we would wireframe it. And then I came back the next day, and they would have slot, slats of wood shaping the shape. Yeah. And I, and really? it, yes. And I was very, I'd never seen anything like this. I'm like, what are you guys doing? And then they slapped clay on top of it and they, they masked it with the clay and then they detailed sculpted it with the clay. Now it's hot there. So clay melts. So they had to wet it and protect it every day, every night. Yeah. And we're talking pieces that were 10, 12, 15 meters long. You know, the giant columns and those yeah. giant crab-looking things that were in there. In America, I've never seen anybody use clay like that. We use clay for small sculptures mm. and bra- when, you're, when you're doing something of bronze. Or we use foam and hard coat. So it was a little, the process was much different. Mm. And then they mold it, take the mold off, and destroy everything and repurpose the clay and use it again. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. yeah. So they had people that their job was to clean the clay, put it in another pile so the new artist can use that same clay. What do you think is the reason for 
I think they were just um, cost efficiency taught that way over the years. And the sure. in the schools yeah. they have they have theming schools uh, to teach their um, their sculptors and painters how to do things for the theme parks. You what? think it was more cost efficient? Yeah. For, that, for, why do you think they were they're taught that way? In the long run, it probably is more cost efficient because you can repurpose reuse, some yeah, of this yeah. stuff and reuse it again and again and with foam and that stuff. You, yeah. and it's it's done. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. With the clay, you can get some uh, amazing details. You know, like fine line work and stuff. So it was a it was a different process that you weren't familiar with, but in the end, it got the results that you yes, needed. Yes, exactly. Their end product was fantastic. All right, I think that about wraps it up. Thanks, guys. I want to thank all our panelists who joined us in this conversation. Uh, Cecil, I definitely want to hear from you because you actually had the opportunity to go and visit it when it was fully completed. You visited Atlantis, Sonia. Yeah, I was invited, fortunately, and it was very uh, uh, humbling to be invited to the ribbon cutting event. Um, and it was spectacular. Yeah. Um, obviously a big investment on Fosun's part. Um, um, amazing presence. Uh, I, f I think they had over 400 people come to the event. Um, very, very high end experience. So wonderful to see our experience being enjoyed by so many people. Absolutely. One of the one of the most interesting things in this conversation, and the panelists, you know, they were all talking amongst themselves even before we started recording about how interesting of a challenge it is to design something that will involve living creatures, mm. you know, in the aquarium, having to design with their behaviors and their health in mind. I kind of reflect back on the project, even as a consumer, I love Atlantis in the Bahamas, and I, me and my family, we frequent going there. And I just remember walking through what they call the dig, which is the the original version of the Lost Chambers. Um, it was spectacular being able to experience aquariums with a storyline yeah. threaded through the... With that theming layer. Layer in the, in the guest area. Um, and so that was really intriguing to me. And I said, gosh, one day I would love to be able to be the one creating the new version of this. And wow, it came true. Absolutely. We were approached and embraced by both Fosun and Kersner to be able to reinvent, which was another challenge, uh, reinvent Atlantis. Um, the way they chose the original Atlantis execution was the old um, discovery of uh, civilization ruins, yeah. ruins underwater. And they didn't want that. The, the new resort is a little bit more contemporary in style. And so they wanted to reinvent that aspect of it. And we came up with a whole approach to make it more of a, uh, a love story, actually, yeah. between a Chinese prince and a princess mermaid. Yeah. And so that became a whole new exercise of creating the chambers to be actually uh, built purposely for the princess mermaid. So it's intriguing to think about that overlay of story, which influences the water park as well from an architectural standpoint, but also tie back in to the logistics of dealing with marine life and, and their you know demands for, for environment. There's also the component of actually needing to design for the element of water itself. Chuck had, you know, they were talking about how they needed to, they needed to paint the colors to be extra, uh, you know, saturated, saturated because yeah. once the water came in, it was going to dull the the colors, it, stuff like that is so, so fascinating that you don't think about all the time when you visit these places. Yeah, and if you do visit during the construction process, you look at the color palette and you <laughs> go, well, whose bad taste is this? <laughs> it looks really gaudy, you know? And so ultimately, when you start to see the algae growth, which is purposeful, and the blue water filter that you have to look through and see the actual color palette, and it's it's elegant. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. I was just so impressed. My phone, I was just taking photos <laughs> left and right. It was unbelievable because I was so inspired by the environment. Yeah. The other layer of interactivity that we introduced with projection mapping on the floor, the touch screens, that was a huge added value to communicate in different ways how to understand and learn about the species themselves. So yeah. guests were really engaged. It was a very powerful experience. And it must be very rewarding to see this thing that you've worked on for so long and then you actually can see 
children reacting to things and and adults, you know, pointing at things. Unbelievable. It was so spectacular to see the guests engage with it. You know, you do these experiences and you design in a laboratory. Yeah. Uh, and you just hope that your ideas and visions come to life, you know, not only from a physical standpoint, from from an engagement standpoint. And when it pays off, it's so rewarding. Well, this was a this was a fantastic conversation and really educational uh from, from from a lot of different perspectives. No doubt. I think that the uh, panelists did a great job of kind of talking through some of the challenges that we had to uh, overcome, but it all paid off. You know, caring about the end product at all f phases of the project is important. It shows. Component. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, see you in the next episode. Thanks, Cecil. You bet. Thanks, Abhinav. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. We'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>